Councilman Protegero, if you'd like to make any remarks uh, before we get the presentation for you. Um, well, this was a very interesting year spent with a lot of the commissioners and getting a lot of good information in order to help our city be a better city. And so I really appreciate the time and effort that everyone spent. And I think that um, the report that you will see presented this afternoon, or this evening rather, will give you um, a really good idea of where we are and what we need to do um, in order to move the needle on um, getting folks out of poverty into good, healthy, working jobs so that they can provide for themselves and their families. Because at the end of the day, that is really what people want to do. They want to provide for themselves, they want to provide for their families, and they want to have a sense of self-worth about themselves. And nothing does that more than being able to just simply uh, take care of yourself you know, in a, in a, in a nice way. Um, even before the report was written, some of the things that came out in our discussions were things that we, as council members, uh, Andy and I and the mayor brought back to the rest of the members of council um, for things that came out, especially um, the issue with the living wage for all of our city employees, which was uh, put into our FY15 um, budget, and it was very surprising that um, I think it was doing was it doing a retreat yes. when we found out that we had individuals who we actually employed on a full time basis that we're not making the living wage and we thought, wow, that's something that we can easily fix. Um, it's, uh, it would seem a little hypocritical if we did not do that. And so we were able to do that in this year's budget. We also uh, work to align zoning regulations with um, state standards for in-home child care providers. One of the things that you will see in this presentation is the, ne the necessity for quality child care, not just babysitters, but quality child care that prepares children to be ready for kindergarten. Um, also, um, looking at universal pre-care, uh, pre-universal preschool, um, we have a, a provision for that in the FY15 budget, and we are making it a priority going forward. So these are some of the things, along with um, supporting the mixed income housing development, using the Broad Creek model as a model throughout the city to be able to bring people of all income levels together so that they can mix their experiences. And then... Um, aligning the work with the Rockefeller Foundation as we were awarded one of the 100 resilient cities um, through that initiative. So those are just some of the things that we worked on during the commission process before the final report that we were actually able to um, implement throughout the city. Um, the one thing that, that drove us to this, I believe, is that for a city our size with so many uh, different people, different races, nationalities, and things like that, we have 16% um, of our families live in poverty. And so we wanted to look at why that is and how we can lower that number. So the commission is um, 33 people who were dedicated and committed citizens from all different types of uh, sectors who have committed their own time and resources um, throughout the last year to research, plan, and commit to an action plan from the city. And the thing about this commission is that it wasn't just a, we come and meet and we get this fluff presentation. Um, it was really a working committee where individuals took ownership of their their subcommittees and their various roles that they played in in the overall committee and brought information and did research. I could probably guess that nobody's done this much research since college. <laughs> so it was really nice when we would get copies of articles and things like that or suggestions from the commission members or calls from them because it for me it just let me know how seriously the commission members took took what we charge them with. Just to follow up on what Angela said, and, and I'll be very brief, 
the we broke up, and I don't know if Angela touched on this. We broke up into four committees: um, early childhood, early childhood development, youth education, and career pathways, neighborhood revitalization and support, and workforce development. And what made this interesting, and I'm just going to touch on these two areas. Some of the cr criticism that we got back were all of you were so successful. Some of you are lawyers. Some of you are administrators of the biggest companies in the city. Um, some of you work for the city. Some of you are in the sheriff's office or police department. And what was interesting is the very first meeting that we met was an opportunity to get to know one another a little bit better. And in talking to each other, not everybody came out of their mother's womb and were lawyers, sheriffs, police officers, doctors, hospital administrators. Each and every person that was on this commission had not only a story of, of witnessing poverty on its level that we deal with it on a daily basis, because many of us do for what we do for a living outside of council, but really our own stories. Um, and we had a chance to share those stories. And the stories weren't necessarily separated too far generationally. Right. Um, the idea that my father spent a year on unemployment. People would never know that, and I know I've never shared that. Or the idea that the generation just before my father, who was an immigrant, was also an immigrant, and used to sell peanuts to the students at Norfolk Academy out of a push cart. So when you look at who we are today, there is an understanding of where we came from and who we are, and that's not forgotten. So that criticism really rings hollow. What we also did is the mayor asked us to go to the neighborhoods, and we did. We went to Huntersville, we went to Southside, we went to Ocean View, and those, commi those community open houses where people could come in. We advertised them. I know in Huntersville, we went door to door. We were, and, and I was concerned because I didn't know if we got the, the notice out. Not everybody reads Virginia Pilot. Did we get it out? Not everybody goes online. But we went door to door and invited families. So we made sure not to miss people. So we got individuals in certain areas that are touched by poverty or are in that 16%, and we had an opportunity to sit down together and listen. So we did not miss that opportunity. That was not missed. On the South Side, the same thing. We were at the South Side at least twice. Mm -hmm. And again, on the South Side, where I know that one of our projects, one of our housing uh, uh, areas is right across the street. You could just walk right across. And people did come right across. And we all sat together and we listened. And we broke down into smaller groups, each of our committee groups, and people listened. So if you hear that, if you're a commission member, and I, I can't thank you enough for everything you did, because you guys really did the heavy lifting. Um, Angela and I were probably just the pretty faces with Paul, our mayor. Uh, I was the pretty face. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, guys, you guys really did the work. So uh, I have a heartfelt thank you. And I also uh, briefly uh, wanted to, uh, in wrapping up, thank uh, Susan per year. Susan, are you here? Well, Susan um, uh, was the, did the Early Childhood Development Chair. She's with the Planning Council. Kurt, uh, is it Hofflich? Hofflich. Uh, from Sentara, and I was talking about you, and I said the largest companies in our city, and you took the time to be there every time. You never missed a meeting. Uh, chair of the Youth Education Career and Pathways uh, Chair. Um, uh, Jose Burgess, Virginia Employment Commission, did the Adult Workforce Development Chair. And, of course, Mike Goldsmith, our police chief, did Neighborhood Revitaliz Revitalization and Support Chair. And... So when the chief comes to us and we've got issues, I mean, the chief's been there and uh, has seen it from the ground up and continues every day to see it from the ground up. So with that, I think uh, you want to do the introduction of our
Paul, would you like for us to move on sure. to our sure, that, that's you want me to do it or would you like to do it, Angela? Um, well, it, we, I can do it. Um, the commission was um, aided by a very knowledgeable consultant who was able to keep us on track and from um, going off into the sidebars. And uh, she was able to uh, put everything together and work with all the different uh, all the different committees. Uh, Safari, Safira Baker of Communitas Consulting was the uh, consultant who worked with us. And so I want to bring up Safira, but um, as she comes, I just want to take the opportunity to thank the staff who worked with her, who volunteered their time. A lot of the city staff members volunteered their time when they heard about what we were doing and they wanted to be a part of it. And so they came out to the meetings and participated in the subgroups and the subcommittees. And so um, this work, again, you know, like Andy said, it, it's, it wasn't what we did. It really is what you all did. And, you know, I'm the pretty face. The other two guys just tagged along. And, well, Sapphire and I are the pretty faces, and the other two guys just tagged along. But um, we, I really want to thank you for that and thank you for the time that you spent because this um, is really going to change our city in a very positive way. Sapphire. Thank you for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and members of City Council, Mayor, uh, City Manager Jones. It's a pleasure to be here. The City of Norfolk has really taken a bold step in stating its goals clearly to reduce poverty and understanding that your community locally has the power to make a difference to do that. Across the country, efforts like this are, are over time making tremendous differences, cutting through red tape at the federal and state level, bringing people from different persuasions and uh, opinions together. And that kind of healthy deliberation really fuels a good community plan. It demonstrates, too, that you have compassion, optimism, and a belief that a healthy city is one where all residents thrive and that um, there is, as you talked about, um, a mix of incomes in your neighborhoods. You chose an exceptional group of people as your commissioners, and they were assisted by a phenomenal group of city team members. I want to say that we just got the evaluations back and people were asked to talk about the elements that were most successful, 100% said the city team um, was ex extremely good, very good. Um, my job was to help these individuals develop a plan that would work based on national research, local input, and the team's deliberation. And we believed throughout that if we brought the appropriate people together to work on a plan with good information, they would come forth with an authentic vision and address the concerns of the community. And we used a consensus method, which was time consuming, um, but in the end got us to make some hard choices. The charge of the commission, again, is, as you've discussed, is to um, re not only understand the nature of poverty, but recommend actions that will increase educational in attainment and employment, um, provide access to resources, and just overall reduce the number of citizens and families living in poverty. What I'm going to do is give you a, a very quick snapshot of the process we went through in the vision. Um, and then what I'm going to ask is that our um, co-chairs in some cases and um, members of the work group come up and just briefly present each group's recommendations. So we'll have, um, after I give you the overview, we'll have Sarah Sturzing, of, um, who is a commission member and is with Chip of Sam Southampton Roads, lead off with the early childhood piece. That'll be followed by Kurt Hofelich, um, Youth Education and Career Pathways from Sentara General, Norfolk General Hospital. Then Hosey Burgess from the Virginia Employment Commission will follow. And then Thaler McCormick with um, Four Kids will be providing the neighborhood revitalization piece. It'll be brief, but I wanted you to see their enthusiasm, passion, ownership um, in person and, and hear from them the work that they did. The primary focus, again, is we use the federal poverty level. We know it's not perfect. We know that it doesn't reflect all of the benefits and resources that are there for families. Um, but we use it because we want to be able to track and measure this plan. And over time, that was an uh, accurate method. And the 130 percent we used because that tracked with um, individuals receiving free and reduced lunch in the schools. And so what that means is that that's um, that's a family of uh, 15,000 for an individual or 31,000 for a family of four. So not a lot of resources for those families. And that's where we targeted. Um, the vision, again, is both aspirational and basic. It's aspirational if you look at it because it, it, it um, asks that individuals in the city of Norfolk have the opportunity to develop their skills 
and to earn a wage that allows them to thrive. It's basic because in order to do that, we just want them to have the access to the basic quality of life that everyone needs to do well, and that's quality housing, education, food, transportation, in some cases, child care and health care. The core values underlie all the recommendations, and um, Councilman Protegero was reminding me of that first meeting when people really shared their values, and those, those drove the process. And this is kind of a synopsis of them, but they were about creating opportunities and access to them, about giving people the tools and predominantly the education needed to be able to take advantage of opportunities and, and build, um, build their own capacities, and to take personal responsibility for economic choices um, and other choices in their personal lives that help them um, become more self-sufficient, and also in investing in cost-effective and proven solutions. So we, we really looked at what had worked in other communities. There were kind of four essential parts of the, the approach. Basically, it was interactive, it was data-driven, and it was grounded in community input, and that was in community experience, and that's really what we wanted to model. Um, we had, again, nine months of meetings. We um, we asked the commissioners again to evaluate the process, and one of the quotes I like was, this was not designed to be a rubber stamp group. You know, it really was kind of a lot of discussion and deliberation. Another said um, how grateful they were that this had finally gotten to the top of the agenda for the city and how thankful they were to be part of that process. Um, so these were actors, and they really took that responsibility um, seriously. So the first piece we did was we, we looked at what had been done before. We looked at our local data. We interviewed. Um, different community leaders, and we, we honed in on those areas of the plan that Councilman Protegero um, spelled out. And then we began to kind of get more specific. Well, what do we mean by um, getting kids ready for school? Um, where? What parts of the city? What, what, what is our tactic going to be that's really effective and proven? We put out some initial ideas and then collected that town hall input from, I think it was about 130 folks the first time. Then we refined the work, went back, created the plan, made some hard choices, got rid of some things, um, brought it back out again to the community and asked them for what was missing and um, where they saw the priorities. And then we drafted the plan and brought it back to you. It's a dense document, I realize, but what, there's kind of a crib sheet in the back, an appendix which has all of the goals and strategies, the outcomes that you'll get if you pursue them. It's a three-year plan, but we anticipate that there are elements of this plan that are going to go last beyond the three years. Um, and that also has a list of the community partners that'll be, piece, that'll be a part of that, um, and an estimate of the budget it might take to um, implement those recommendations. So what I wanted to say is that, as you know, poverty is, not, is more than just about income. It's really about your stability, both mental, physical, about the consistency of the ability to, to have a healthy, nutritious food, to have a good quality of education. It impacts families and individuals every day and the choices that they make. And even with income, um, many people have, just don't have enough income to meet those basic quality needs that we've been talking about, which are sort of a... Um, a core piece of what it needs, what people need to raise healthy kids and reach their, um, reach their potential. So reducing poverty makes sense both from the heart and the head. All people deserve to, to thrive. That's kind of more of the emotional pull. But also Norfolk's future economic health is threatened if many of its citizens can't contribute to the growth and vitality that's part of your collective future. This report is not to be a comprehensive plan. It's really <coughs> Commissioners worked hard to get it down to four goals and two or three strategies each. And so you'll see that there, um, that there are certain strategies we think are more effective than others. Um, but what I want to say is you start with a really strong foundation in Norfolk. So in addition to having strong industries with health care and the federal and civilian government and the military, you also um, have a burgeoning economy. And then this list is really a list of... Um, programs and ideas that came up in the town hall meeting where people said, we're already doing this pretty well. And so that is going to be a foundation for the work that you um, do at the commission in its next step. You're going to be tapping what already works. In terms of who lives in poverty, it's diverse. There, um, it touches every type of family. What this slide does is pulls up some of the areas where it is most um, concentrated, and that's with young children. 
It's with female-headed household. It's um, largely with minority populations. 58% of the folks in poverty are African American. And over 50% are under age 25. So you'll see ma ma many of the strategies skew toward the younger population because that's where a lot of the need was. Of course, also having a job really defines your, um, your ability to make ends meet. And you're going to see that the folks who are unemployed are obviously more in poverty, but also they're less educated and face greater barriers moving ahead. And this is just a simple slide that really shows the relationship between high school completion and um, employment and the importance of a high school graduate and then some post-secondary education um, to get ahead and get a job that sustains a family. Okay, so we took these findings and then the commissioners um, were working in these specific work groups to basically come up with very concise goals and strategies. So I'm now going to go to Sarah Sturzing, who's going to head up um, and talk to you a little bit about the early childhood piece. Good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to say one thing. As a citizen and a person who spent my whole professional career starting out of four kids in Norfolk, working with families in poverty, I appreciated being a part of this whole process. It was uh, gratifying to me to see this group of sort of the heads of state come together to focus in on this huge issue. But I know I only have three minutes or Susan will throw something at me. So um, we have 2,000 days to get it right from the time a child is born, and actually probably another 275 days before a child is born to get it right. Without a high quality early childhood, no child is going to get to kindergarten ready, and we're going to be doing nothing but spending more money um, working on them and trying to remediate them from the very beginning. So our work group was made up of um, the head of ODU. Um, we had uh, Dr. Simmons, Thaler, myself, Suzanne Purrier, who was the chair um, of the committee, came together and worked pretty diligently to sort of um, narrow down the areas that we thought would be um, the priorities. And thankfully, North is ahead of the game, um, you know, with the vision to have an early childhood coordinator in the city of Norfolk and really focus in on that with the help of Smart Beginnings and now E3. So I think Norfolk's ahead of the game already, which is wonderful. Um, the, the first strategy and some of the action steps that fell beneath them um, to kick things off, high quality early childhood, um, if you hadn't heard me say it before in the past, is obviously um, the number one thing we can do is a system change in the city of Norfolk to really move, move the needle for children in the city. And Norfolk, of course, has already started off with working with Smart Beginnings um, and getting the, the, the star rating system for early childhood centers. And one of the areas that I was so happy to find out was that um, sort of the preliminary work that we'd put in place to get early um, childhood home providers aligned with um, the state regulations, which you all participated in and made happen, which um, is very gratifying to know that now early childhood homes are going to be able to be rated and that there's some movement to try and help them, if they're not rated, to get into the system to get licensed. Um, in the city where we have the highest poverty areas, we don't have the quality centers. I, I live in Estabrook in the Norview area, and it's probably a mile and a half to the closest early childhood center, um, probably further to one that is a star quality rated center. So for a family who's living in an apartment on Robin Hood Road to find high quality care, it's, it's not anywhere close by and definitely not available to them within walking distance. Um, the first strategy was to increase the number of high quality care homes and centers um, and working with the, high, uh, the Virginia Star Quality Initiative um, to help them get designated. The second strategy was really to increase the level of quality in all the systems of care to educate children from birth to, to age five. Um, we have this wonderful opportunity in Norfolk to participate in this full-scale comprehensive kindergarten readiness initiative. And one of our recommendations was to really um, encourage Norfolk Public Schools to participate and sign on to do that. Um, that would help us to know where kids are coming to us from, what they have when they enter kindergarten, and what we can do to help them move ahead. Uh, and also to just create the universal preschool system. And uh, Norfolk Public Schools has, has already started with a four-year-old. We, 
looked at the price to have universal preschool for all children, uh, three, four, two, three, and four-year-olds, and there was a little bit of sticker shock when we looked at the actual cost of that. Um, it was in, I don't know, $60 million. So we are looking at that as something that could be phased in over the next few years, and, and hopefully we will be able to capture all those children, get them engaged earlier. Um, the third strategy is connecting families in need with early intervention and support services. And beautifully, I'm so happy to know that Norfolk General um, and the Planning Council are coming together to do what's called universal um, screening, which means every single baby that's born in the hospital has a nurse come into the room, talk to the family, do a quick assessment with them to see what their needs may be, and then be able to work with the Planning Council to get them referred to a home visiting program like CHIP or the UP Center in Norfolk. Um, to get those families with a safety net around them from the very start. Um, our hope is that we can identify families earlier than that prenatally so that we can get to them so they have a healthy pregnancy all the way through. Um, so that's kicking off as of July 15th. I just found out myself today, so that's awesome news. Um, and then our final strategy that we are looking at is just community-wide education, um, a big piece of just spreading the word um, throughout the city, having a checklist so that um, parents and educators throughout the city are all on the same page. What do children need, um, both physically, emotionally, socially, when they enter kindergarten, as well as academically, of course, and what they can be doing to help prepare them and make it a citywide campaign and effort so that everyone knows what, where they need to be. Um, as well as, let me see what our final thing was here. And just coordinating all services. Um, we really want to hope that we can, we can coordinate better efforts between not just the school system and, and those agencies, but home visiting, the hospitals, law enforcement. Um, you know, I say it all the time, but if we fix them here, um, you guys, I'll put them all out of business. We won't need to be investing so much money in special ed, um, in the justice system, and, and helping to remediate people when they're 15 years old. If we get them from the beginning, um, we, can, we can change everything. We can change that trajectory. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Good evening. I'm uh, Kurt Hoflick, the president of Centera Norfolk General Hospital, and I had the distinct pleasure of leading the um, youth education and career development uh, sub-team. We were fortunate. We had a very engaged uh, subcommittee. We uh, had the involvement of subject matter experts uh, from Norfolk Public Schools, um, from the city, uh, social services, housing development was on our committee, uh, as well as representatives from the United Way which you'll hear are doing a lot of good work in the community, uh, trying to close the uh, uh, achievement gaps for, for young children uh, in the education systems. And uh, so I'll, I'll jump right into it with our primary objective. Uh, our uh, youth education and career development primary objective was to prepare the youth and young adults to secure family sustaining employment uh, through effective programs that address, address both in-school and out-of-school factors. Uh, the findings from our research uh, for children living in poverty, it is primarily out-of-school factors that impact their ability to, su to succeed academically. As much as 66% of the influence of whether they will thrive and progress uh, in elementary uh, school settings is based on uh, what occurs outside of school, uh, not, not necessarily what occurs inside of school. Uh, persistent social and emotional stress, uh, limits on the family's ability to help with homework. During our community uh, open house settings, uh, we met family member after family member who uh, did not graduate high school themselves, uh, many single parent uh, homes. Um, where uh, mom and dad did not graduate high school. So their knowledge set and ability uh, to help uh, young children with homework is limited. Uh, overcrowded housing, unpredictable support systems, uh, poor nutrition, uh, et cetera. These all are out of school factors that impact uh, their ability to thrive in school. Uh, we also learned that effective out of school time programs can help elementary and middle school uh, students stay more engaged in learning and uh, progressing, uh, particularly over the summer months. 
Uh, we also learned that summer learning loss, um, this uh, achievement gap uh, that occurs for children in poverty, uh, can actually be reversed. Uh, we had a group of uh, interested members of the community coordinated by United for Children with United Way uh, that traveled to Harlem to look at uh, what the city of Harlem was doing to move um, their achievement scores for uh, impoverished children in uh, the elementary grades. Uh, they studied uh, the Boston Connects program. Uh, so these recommendations were built on evidence-based uh, programs that have been highly effective in other cities uh, trying to address their poverty issues. The PB Young pilot uh, is a program uh, that uh, was implemented uh, right here in Young Terrace uh, with a summer elementary uh, school uh, enrichment program. Uh, this was coordinated through uh, United for Children and outcomes on reading and math were quite impressive. Uh, not only did they eliminate the um, achievement gap over the summer, the learning loss, but they actually improved the learning scores uh, of these young children over the summer uh, to assure that when they entered school in the fall uh, in the next grade uh, that they didn't have a lot of rework to do to relearn uh, the skills that they had learned in the previous year. Uh, shrinking employment opportunities for teens and young adults, uh, particularly in low-income black and his Hispanic uh, teens and limited opportunities for young people to explore career interests or prepare for jobs in the future. So our uh, recommendations fell into two key strategies. Uh, the first is to improve academic achievement for low-income elementary, middle, and high school students, uh, for which there are three primary tactics. Uh, first, offer high-quality, out-of-school, enrichment programs and education programs during the summer, and after school programs uh, for elementary and middle school students. Uh, this is primarily based on replicating the PB Young Elementary School pilot, again coordinated by uh, United for Children, uh, which provides an extended school year uh, through a summer enrichment program. Uh, at the urging of the mayor and with the support of the commission, United for Children has extended uh, the PB Young model to another elementary school this year, uh, Tidewater Park, uh, which I understand just got underway uh, this week, uh, to get uh, two of our most stressed neighborhoods uh, implemented early uh, in consideration of the, the high potential that that tactic offers the community. Uh, third uh, is to implement the open campus high school model. Uh, this is a model that offers flexible scheduling and uh, personal learning plans for at-risk youth. Uh, the recommendation uh, did get a lot of early traction uh, with Norfolk Public Schools. I understand the first program is scheduled to uh, go online and open September 1st. Uh, it's a collaboration with the Magic Johnson uh, Bridgescape organization uh, that is focused on assisting students who have either uh, already dropped out of high school or are at risk of dropping out. It involves alternative path to uh, earning a high school diploma that fits the schedule, uh, life circumstances, and learning needs of uh, this at-risk population. <coughs> the second strategy is focused on improving quality and exposure of children to career, education, and skills training uh, for Norfolk's youth. Uh, there are four key tactics under the strategy. First and foremost uh, is to partner with the Hampton Roads employers to document career pathways and develop educational content for Norfolk Public Schools. Uh, in our region, uh, there are a number of large employer groups who are uh, looking to recruit uh, people with uh, a minimum skill set of high school graduate level education and some uh, technical training. Uh, we need to get these uh, career pathways documented and on paper. Uh, during the Commission's work, pathways for uh, shipbuilding maritime industry uh, were accomplished, and work is currently being done on healthcare care industries um, and opportunities with our hospitals. Based on the models, uh, we need to implement a training program, uh, training our educators, teachers, and guidance counselors in 
uh, the career pathways that are available within the community. Uh, we heard time and time again uh, during our open community sessions that um, folks uh, in the public school system feel that the, um, the role of the counselor has uh, been uh, focused on the academic courses that need to be taken in the following year to achieve readiness for college and that there is very little emphasis on uh, alternative pathways into technical careers and uh, vocational careers. Uh, educating our Norfolk Public Schools uh, middle and high school uh, students in career options, um, developing internships and work experiences. These can be accomplished uh, many times through in-kind uh, contributions of our uh, largest employers in the region. All we need to do really is open our doors and provide in-kind opportunities for students to come in and learn uh, the roles and uh, responsibilities of uh, people within our own uh, workforce. And last but not least is to approve and implement the proposed career and technical high school uh, through a private and uh, public collective impact model for collaborative funding. Uh, the Commission heard a presentation on the proposed career and technical high school uh, from the Greater Norfolk Corporation and co our colleagues from Norfolk Public Schools and we believe this can be a game changer uh, for Norfolk's youth and the region. Uh, however, the Commission members also recognize uh, that the funding would have to be accomplished through a unique uh, public and private collaborative uh, for such endeavor. And that concludes our recommendations. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Kurt. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the uh, goal three, which is the, the adult uh, workforce development. Uh, we had a, a, a the commission's uh, group was uh, made up of myself from Virginia Employment Commission, uh, Ms. Judy Beglin from Opportunity Inc., uh, several people from social services and, uh, and educators, and also we had a uh, uh, member from the sheriff's, sheriff's office was, was available for, for us to provide some good information regarding what's going on. Uh, we also had uh, a representative from Step Up, Ms. Uh, Sandra Branch, that brought a lot of information to us about the, the need of the people and, and so forth. We also had a representative uh, that discussed, uh, that had expertise in the uh, senior uh, needs of, of, of the senior uh, job seekers. Uh, some of the findings, again, our, our main goal was to help the adults prepare for workplace by expanding access to career development programs and employment support. And uh, some of the key findings that we found was that poverty is about educational attainment. Again, the more educated folks are, the better. A lot of the jobs that are required in this city, uh, especially with your federal government and all your, uh, uh, mostly your professional jobs, they require education. And uh, those are some of the, some of the, some of the barriers that's, that's, uh, that operates in the city. Adults in poverty do not have the education required for most of those job openings within the city or region. So again, that's a, a, a major barrier that we, we're trying to uh, overcome. Uh, Norfolk has the second lowest high school standard uh, completion rate, 77% after Franklin is 72%. And that, that rate is lower by gender and race for some groups. More than 75% of the job openings require a high school diploma, 29.3% uh, 29, uh, or a bachelor bachelor degree at forty seven point seven percent. So again, you know, we we kind of saw the need for education as, and training as, as one of our one of our key goals. Uh, the Norfolk residents in poverty twenty nine percent have less than a high school de degree. Fewer than seven percent of the Norfolk job openings have no minimum education requirements. Uh, employers are unable to find the employees they need due to lack of uh, industry specific experience. The need for on the job training. And one of the key barriers, because Norfolk is one of the, for the state of Virginia, one of the largest areas where we get the returning citizens from, uh, from the penal systems. And that is one of the key barriers there that's, that's stopping, because I see that on a day-to-day -day basis in my, in my job where we have an employer that's ready to hire. Uh, just last week, I had an employer in my office ready to hire, and we had a room full of people that were interested in the job that they offered. 
but when they had to stipulate, because again, they had a federal contract and they had to get people on and off the security bases and things like that, almost half the people kind of were not qualified for the job because of that background. Uh, again, with some of the strategies that we were looking at and some of the recommendations and action steps for that first strategy, which was increase inf information about access to employment, education, and training opportunities and work-related resources. Uh, what we found is, and the word we got from a lot of the different town hall meetings and, and also from the, from, from the uh, commissions, is that folks didn't know exactly where uh, assets were so they can get the resources that they needed in order to move up. Move up, move up. And so one of the strategies with that was collect resources and or develop a guide for community employment and education opportunities. And we wanted to have some, something with the city having a single source where all the different agencies would provide that information to that single source in, in some kind of way broadcast it out and then launch a public relations campaign to inform the citizens and employers about available workforce uh, resources, uh, provide resources to the libraries and the other centrally located organizations to operate centers of, of access points for workforce preparations. Uh, we're currently doing that, uh, uh, and when I say by we, our Workforce Investment Act partners, uh, the VEC, Opportunity Inc., DARS, and other Workforce Investment Act partners, where we work with the uh, library systems throughout, the, throughout this region here, and we call what we call it Shared Network Access Points, short for SNAP, if you have another, another acronym. And what that does is that brings the, some of the librarians in. They have a lot of computers, and we notice that a lot of folks are using the computers in the libraries, especially in Norfolk and other places. Uh, and if we can have somebody that can show them how to access the workforce system information so they can have access to that. And we have maybe a day of training with the uh, librarians and give them some librarian staff and give them some information so that they can have and also maintain that liaison with them as they, uh, as they see the people operating this and, and trying to find work uh, using, their, using their systems. Uh, strategy number two was to pro provide access, support, and information to service and adult population living in poverty. And again, we're looking at gathering information to determine the local population's need and, and their most significant barriers to employment, and then make recommendations to address obstacles to education and employment. And we're looking at conducting a uh, service asset for gap analysis of existing employment and training resources uh, in the city to identify the areas to focus in. Uh, one of the concerns of the finding of the SS with the, the Norfolk Reentry Council in finali finalizing recommendations for previously incarcerated adults. And this particular information in population was one of that the commission thought was increasingly important to focus on and it was most, it was also mentioned at several of the town hall meetings through the outreach of the Poverty Commission. Norfolk Reentry Council has agreed to do a gap analysis to identify gaps in services that could potentially assist this population of Norfolk residents. And again, uh, what we found is that uh, that group needs more than just a, uh, they need kind of more of a hand-holding uh, presence to, to get them back on, back on, back on, on, on task. Uh, and uh, strategy number three was to promote workforce development resources as part of the city of Norfolk's business retention effort. And again, with working with the employers uh, as part of the city's economic development efforts continue to assist the Norfolk business Workforce needs. We want to know what the work, what the businesses need, and provide our regular feedback to our WIA and Opportunity Inc. and One Stop System uh, partners, and encourage major public and private businesses to identify and utilize and provide support to small uh, women-owned businesses and, and minority-owned contractors and businesses. But uh, those are those are most of the things. What we what we also found was that a lot of the folks are uh, that were in that are in poverty. Half the adults in poverty work full time or part time, so it's just like upskilling them to a, a better, uh, better able to uh, take care of their, uh, get suitable employment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am playing the role of Chief Goldsmith this afternoon. People often confuse us, so. <laughs> Um, I, I was. <laughs> he, he chaired that. He chaired that. Um, 
I uh, served on the Neighborhood Revitalization Committee, and we had many vigorous conversations this year, a lot of uh, terrific committee members. And we spent our year looking at the physical and social environment that our poorest citizens inhabit, uh, specifically our neighborhoods. Our goal was to create safe and thriving communities by increasing access to jobs, neighborhood amenities, and quality affordable housing. We looked at a lot of data this year, but a few points stuck out. Families making around 12,000 and under, or the bottom 25% of Norfolk's earners, are spending 92% of their income on housing. They're doubling and tripling up and highly mobile. This has a profound impact on their ability to advance and succeed and to educate their children. With less federal money going into public and subsidized housing, we were concerned that a loss of public and subsidized housing is actually going to increase the housing stress of Norfolk's families. And lastly, we also observed that the concentration of poverty in Norfolk aligns with our seven, seven public housing communities. Research tells us that poor people do better when they don't live in highly concentrated areas of poverty. And it also tells us, which most people don't know, that middle income and upper income families aren't harmed when poor people enter their neighborhoods, provided their housing is well built and well managed. With all this in mind, we identified three strategies to revitalize our distressed neighborhoods. First, we want to stabilize them through community revitalization and economic development. We want to develop mixed income housing and mixed use communities. And we want to begin laying the foundation to deconcentrate poverty in Norfolk's public housing communities. We've got a handful of steps to accomplish these. To stabilize our stressed neighborhoods, we specifically recommend that we expand the Neighbors Building Neighborhoods program, strengthen community corridors with programs like Better Block, expand a rental, assistant, uh, rental inspection program for Norfolk, and select and implement a proven high-impact revitalization strategy, something like Promise Neighborhoods. So these strategies are being used all over the country. To develop mixed-income housing and mixed-use communities, we recommend the creation of a citywide and regional housing plan. This will include implementation strategies and ensure an adequate supply of affordable housing throughout the region, not just Norfolk. We want to establish a regional, we use that word a lot, housing trust fund to finance quality affordable housing. Local investments clearly needed if we're going to ensure the diversity and quality of our total housing stock. And finally, we want to educate the public through a community education campaign about the benefits and positive outcomes associated with affordable and mixed income housing. On our last strategy, which was a tough one, we spent a lot of time talking about this, um, working on deconcentrating poverty in Norfolk's public housing communities. Uh, we strongly felt this was needed to provide a much healthier mixed income environment for our families. And to start this process, we think there's going to need to be policy changes at the city and housing authority level and zoning changes throughout the city. Um, while this was very important, our committee felt it was um, essential that we get some of this other stuff done, looking at our neighborhoods and expanding the affordable housing stock before we tackle significant policy changes um, in public housing. So while there's a lot more to do, we think these are some great steps to go a long way at creating uh, safer and more stable neighborhoods for all Norfolk citizens. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go through the rest relatively quickly. The cross-cutting strategies are really to get the work done. They're, they're about implementing the structure and coordinating the services so that services, both current and new ones, are easy to access. And that's to increase the awareness and use of available resources and to coordinate the implementation of the plan. I'm going to talk a little bit about implementation. Um, we did some studies of other commissions that had reduced poverty in other cities and towns across the country and um, multi-sector alliances, and, and a few things that, um, that seem critical to, for these efforts to success. They need to be owned by multiple sectors, private, corporate, philanthropic, public, um, and people need to feel responsible for that. They need to have measurable wins so that you can track it, so that you know when you've achieved those goals. They have to have identifiable and influential champions and decision makers at the table. In, order, in, in other words, your voice needs to count, the table needs to matter, 
and that needs to have a high visibility um, in the community, high visibility and um, ability to generate enthusiasm, resources, and change. And they have to be built upon strong agencies um, in the community to be able to, de to deliver the good services. You also have to have a venue for engaging residents, um, not only as we did kind of on a one or two time basis, but on an ongoing basis to shape the planning and um, make it relevant for people and communities. And then they have to be efficient and effective. So um, at a point in the process, I was asked to think about what structure might work in Norfolk. And I think Norfolk, you're going to have your context of what works here, but we did look at both city offices and um, community-based coalitions, and I ended up recommending a community-based coalition model, and the commissioners were comfortable with that. And I'll tell you the reason why. I think this, the comprehensive nature of this work really lends itself to a multi-agency alliance. There's no one office or individual that can do this work alone. This is going to require the faith-based community, it's going to require the corporate community, it's going to require public dollars but, and federal and state, um, but you want to have that kind of shared investment from the start. Um, much of the work is already underway in Norfolk, so I think that's, that's a real foundational strength you have. And what you want to do is bring in kind of a convener who can advance that work that's already taking place, coordinate it, link it to the outcomes, and be able to communicate to the public regularly and saying, this is, this is where we're going, this is what we've accomplished, this is what needs to happen. And to also be flexible. As new information comes in, new research, um, new conditions, you want to be able to respond to that um, in a community-wide way. So what, what many communities have done is to really create something like, um, like the commission, but smaller and leaner in a sense, that you have a steering committee of influential community leaders that have, that show that sort of nonprofit, public, private ownership and investment. And they're sort of your high profile board. They're the emissaries. They're the resource developers. Um, they're also monitoring and making sure the, the plan is taking place. And generally, they will, they will have, um, working with them a leadership team, which might be the point persons, they could be executive directors, they could be essentially the leaders that are gonna drive those goals. You got four goals, you're gonna have, you might have some variation of that, but you're gonna have you know, an early childhood um, person on your program management team, you're gonna have neighborhood revitalization. And then beneath that, you might have just action teams doing specific things. So somebody might be working on the quality child care initiative. Um, somebody might be working on the housing trust fund. Again, not all new committees. There are already committees doing this kind of work, but then you have this sort of support role. Well, it's, a, it's a coordinator, a convener, who's making, who's kind of um, making sure that the work's happening, that people are communicating, that it's coordinated, not duplicative, and that you speak to the community about what it's accomplishing. And so it's sort of a problem solver as well as a coach. And then that person also and that entity in, creates ways for the community to be actively involved, whether it's venues or committees um, or neighborhood projects. There's, there's a sort of a public face to this as well as kind of an internal um, communication and coordination role. <coughs> so the task that you took on is very bold, as I've said and as you've heard, and a lot of the, the recommendations in the report are game changers. They really will change the face of poverty in Norfolk, and they will take a lot of time to do. Some of them you can do tomorrow. Some of them are underway. So we've given you a lot of choices, and we've, um, we've built it so that it's practical and it's doable. And I, I can't convey this enough, but it really is a community plan. It, it, it needs to be a plan that's, that's embraced by all different sectors of the community. Because as you know, local government can only do so much. And this kind of thing, um, if you look at some of the, the revitalization models, you know, they have $22 million <coughs> of commercial loan funds invested in them, along with some public, <coughs> federal, and state dollars. So both financially and leadership-wise, you want that diversity. These are some short-term next steps for getting going. Um, but those are also in your um, packet in terms of the appendix. Um, we've done some of the homework for you in that you have, an, uh, you have an appendix and you have a draft budget that you can use to think about prioritization. We also asked the commissioners to identify their priorities and we'll share that with you. Um, I want um, to end up here just by thanking you for the opportunity to be part of this. It's been an honor for me and really a privilege um, <coughs> to be part of this work, to witness the tremendous passion of the commissioners, the city staff, the city leadership, um, and to, to watch it unfold and to see how um, people went from kind of coming in with their own experience of poverty to learning, getting immersed, and then coming out with a very concrete set of recommendations. 
And I think the best compliment you can offer this team is, and the residents who shape the plan is to get to work and to start implementing the recommendations. So I hope you will. And again, I thank you for, for um, engaging me in this work and giving me this learning opportunity and also um, for your support of the plan and as it moves forward. Thank you. Um, <coughs> yes, sir. Mr. McPhillips. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mayor Frame and members of council, City Manager Jones, for inviting me to, um, to speak uh, briefly to you this afternoon. These remarks are my own. However, I am one of uh, 25 commissioners who have delivered a letter to you. I hope you have it before you. Uh, a letter endorsing uh, the Norfolk plan to reduce poverty while also calling your attention to some unfinished business that the Commission, primarily for reasons of time, was unable to tackle. In no way does this acknowledgement of unfinished business imply any criticism of the report that has just been presented to you. On the contrary, I am most grateful, indeed honored, for the opportunity to have served on this distinguished Commission. And like my 24 colleagues, whom I have joined as a signatory to the letter, I concur in the report's recommendations. The unfinished business I refer to is our letter's call for a, a credible body, another credible body, to examine carefully and open-mindedly whether we here in Norfolk can effectively and sensibly <coughs> attack the most powerful determinant of whether our city's families achieve a middle-class standard of living or, instead, dwell in poverty. Indeed, a number of us fear that if we fail to confront head-on the uncomfortable reality the documented root cause of why so many of our fellow Norfolkians remain mired in poverty. As you heard, one out of every four of our children, one out of every five of our citizens overall. If we fail to confront that reality, then whatever positive waves we make by the worthwhile programs and services we advocate today, those waves will be sw simply swamped, nullified by a demographic tidal wave that impoverishes far too many of our citizens. Here's why. The share of American children being raised in single-parent families has almost tripled since 1968. Meanwhile, high school completion rates have been largely stagnant, and workforce participation rates of both working-age men and women have declined. Now embody these strands of data in the flesh and blood of a family headed by a single parent who has not completed high school and does not participate in the full-time workforce and the result is, unfortunately, a family that is practically, practically doomed to poverty. And there will never be enough taxpayer dollars or government programs or services to reverse this outcome. In Norfolk, 27.7 percent of our children, 18 percent of our residents of all ages, and 14.4 percent of our families live below the poverty line. While only 4.5, less than 5 percent of married couple households in Norfolk are poor, 33.8% of female-headed households and 46.4% of female-headed households with children under five are poor. Statewide and national statistics mirror these Norfolk numbers in documenting how single-parent families and their children are much more vulnerable to poverty. For example, the Weldon Cooper Center at the University of Virginia utilizes something called the Virginia Poverty Measure, different from the Census Bureau numbers we typically use. The Virginia Poverty Measure takes into account transfer payments and in-kind services in defining who is poor or near poor. Near poor is somebody who's in, economically insecure basically within 150 percent of that poverty measure of uh, definition of poverty. While only 21 percent of Virginia children in married couple families live in or near poverty, according to this measure, more than 60 percent, more than 63 times uh, the number of children in single parent families live in or near poverty. So we know that children in female-headed families are many times, five, six, seven times, more likely to be poor than children in married couple families. And their poverty lasts much longer. One in five children raised in a single parent family will suffer long-term poverty, while only 2% of children raised in two parent families will suffer long-term poverty. Now that nationally, 40% of all babies are born out of wedlock, and 30 percent of all children are living in single parent families, the elevated frequency and the extended duration of their children's deprivation reveal the core reality of poverty here in Norfolk and nationwide. However, 
solid research has revealed a path forward. We do not have to give up in despair. We can do something about this. We know, for example, from abundant data, especially the findings reported by two of the foremost analysts of poverty in America, Ron Haskins and Isabel Sawhill of the Brookings Institution, that an individual who, A, completes high school, B, goes to work full time, and C, marries before having children, will have virtually no risk, virtually no risk, of succumbing to poverty. Indeed, if a family is headed by an able-bodied high school graduate who works full time and waits until age 21 to marry and then have children, the individuals in that family have a 98% probability of escaping poverty. As Haskins and Sawhill put it, personal responsibility matters. Indeed, as they summarize the evidence, great advantages, financial and otherwise, accrue to individuals who follow the success sequence, that A, B, C, I just stated to you. In their professional judgment, the empirical research goes beyond showing a correlation to proving a causal relationship between adhering to the success sequence on the one hand and avoiding poverty, indeed attaining the American dream of a middle class livelihood on the other. Now, whether we can effectively and sensitively promote wider adoption of the success sequence is the proposition we need to study. We are driven to this conclusion exclusively by the data, not by ideology, politics, or any other agenda. The truth is, though, that although some individuals will escape poverty, indeed we have folks who spoke to the commission who escaped poverty despite uh, a step along the way they might have missed in the success week sequence, that though some will, 76% of individuals living in families that do not observe any of those three steps, three quarters, they will be poor. Among families observing only one or two of those steps, 27% of them will find themselves poor. And again, only 2% of families who observe all three steps in the success sequence will wind up poor. Haskins and Sawhill estimate that the national poverty rate would be cut by 25%, one quarter, if we simply return to the percentage of children living in single parent families that have prevailed in 1970. Indeed, in previous research, they concluded that if the poor were able to complete high school, marry as much as they did in the 1970s, and limit the size of their families to the typical size of a middle class family, the poverty rate would fall by as much as 70%. Chuck, I'm going to have to ask you to, to wrap up. Move. Yeah, please, because I've got a speech I want to give to here. In Great. The <laughs> so, wrapping up. <laughs> what that letter says is what we ask uh, a, a credible body to do is to take forward a, a study, a pilot um, project, if you will, so that we here in the community level can attack a problem that exists nationally and take a lead nationally in addressing the, uh, the root cause, um, the, the, the real reality of what causes poverty in, um, in Norfolk. Thank you, Mayor, for inviting Thank members you. of the council. Sure. Thank you. And uh, Chuck, I meant that in a nice way. We're at 5 o'clock. We're supposed to have dinner downstairs. And I did want to take a couple minutes and repeat everything that's been said already because I feel inclined to. But I, um, first of all, I really want to uh, uh, express uh, my gratitude to uh, Angela and Andy for their leadership. Um, you know, most of this is just showing up. And they showed and they came. And I think that uh, instilled some confidence in the other members of the commission that this matter was be was being taken seriously. We tried to convene you because we know that you're the experts, and so we listened a lot. We tried to open up the meetings and things, but you were the ones who really drove it. So, um, but uh, Andy to uh, Councilman Protegero and the Vice Mayor Angela Williams, I want to thank you on behalf of the really not only the council but the the entire city for what I think is a very important document and a very important moment uh, for this community. Um, I want to thank the commission members. Um, um, we picked up a few commission members as we went along, and that was a great thing. Um, the, the group grew. I thought it might start to wither a little bit, but everybody, everybody hung in there. I think, I mean, uh, the meetings were three hours long. Even through a storm. You know, in through storms, and the food wasn't good, and it really, <laughs> it was this... Whatever budget you put us on, mm. Mr. Mayor. Jared, we were within it, I promise you. We didn't, but, uh, and, um, but the, uh, uh, they came, and after a while, people really started, I mean, enjoying the meetings and, and each other. And as you know, we have some really
strong views here. Mr. McPhillips has a very strong view about personal responsibility. Other people think that it's also structurally related, that children really uh, don't have a choice about what sort of environment they're born into, and that impacts their, that has great consequences on their, on their lives uh, moving forward. And so there was always a good give and take here. Um, I want to thank the city staff. I mean, first of all, the commission members, absolute heroes in, in my, in my opinion. And I've been around here a long time, have not been with a group that was more committed. Uh, I learned a lot. I mean, I, I, I really do. And the way that you talk to each other and the language that you used, I thought was remarkable. And so I really want to, uh, to thank you for that education that I got and really, you know, was inspiring. Um, I want to thank Dr. Perry and Nora and everybody who got to, who worked. Uh, and Mr. Manager, thank you for making that available uh, to us uh, and the rest of the city city staff. I want you know James, everybody who came time after time to this. And now you know this is going to take some management skills here because maybe the most important thing is what what uh, Sapphira said at the end about how we you know you know gather ourselves to actually manage this process forward. So we really do have you know, have the impact that we want. So that's gonna, we're gonna have to sit down and make sure we get that right as well. Um, you know, this came out of, a, out of sort of a notion that the city seems to be, it didn't, I, mean, it, I mean, the facts are, are real. The city, we're a better place to live today than we were just a couple years ago. But um, the, the census figures don't show any improvement on the, on the poverty line piece. We're, we have remained about twice what the what the national what the statewide average is as far as poverty goes, and we haven't been able to move that. In fact, with the recent downturn and recession, those numbers have gone the wrong way. And the most startling fact is that over 27 percent, I think I don't know who mentioned that, Chuck, you did 27.7 percent of the children in the city are live at or below the poverty line. And that's just I mean that is not acceptable. It is simply. Not acceptable. The number, I mean, there's a startling number in here in this report, about 71% of the children who are in our public school system are at or below the poverty line. And when you actually, 84% of the African Americans who come are, are, are somewhere but at or below the poverty line in our public schools. You know, we have attainment issues, but we have a lot of societal issues as well. They're, they're impacting our ability to, the, the children's ability to uh, to succeed. So um, we have a lot of information to digest. I would hope the city council would would read this report. The report is an excellent one. It was drafted in language that everybody can understand and appreciate. And that's not easy, especially when some of this stuff is so technical. I, I think all of us here at the council, we're not experts, but we can understand all this stuff. And the community leaders who will read this in the future will be able to to understand uh, the language here. On page eight, the data about Norfolk starts, and it is, it is um, uh, eye-opening about, you know, the task in front of us and what we have to do and how the city is characterized in these many pages. So uh, I would urge you to, to read that, and then you will find, you know, sort of a call to arms. So once you do, um, you know, I think for too long, and I've said this before, that the city has has tried to mitigate the worst effects of poverty. We've paid, we sort of play defense, and I've said that before. I mean, you know, we have soup kitchens. We provide food, some shelter. Um, we, uh, um, you know, try to provide services to the poor. But th that hasn't helped any of them as far as being lifted out of poverty. Uh, and uh, so we need to be on the offensive. We've played defense for too long in some way to actually allow to, un to unleash the human potential of these children who and young adults and even elderly folks who are living in poverty to give them a way forward. And I think these four strategies here really uh, provide that, that roadmap uh, for us here. Uh, there are probably other ways to do it, but, this, but these are, these are uh, uh, excellent uh, strategies for us. So um, again, I want to thank you for the excellent report. The council will now take some time to read it and then gather ourselves at an appropriate moment, maybe at least during some of the, uh, some of our retreat. Uh, there will be monies that will need to be made available. Uh, and I would even say to, to Marcus that, you know, I'd, even within City Hall, we can have a cultural change. I mean, it ought to be everybody's responsibility who works for this city. 
you know, when they <clears throat> come to work to figure out what they can do, how they can be a part of solving this issue for us as well. And that will start with you and with the department heads to make sure this culture within the, our, our city employees understands that on a routine basis, you know, part of their job is, is trying to communicate and to act in a way to us and, and to also implement these strategies, but, but come back to us with what we can do, you know, to help a neighbor or a block of people, a group of people, one or two at a time, come out of poverty as well, and also using these broader strategies. So in any event, there will be more to say, I, th I think, in the future. Again, I want to thank all the members of uh, everybody here, uh, all the members of the commission, uh, uh, played a very uh, a positive role. We actually, be, this, we're actually ending when we said we were. A lot of communities don't. I mean, we said we're going to give this a year. And some of the, when I called some of you to see if you would serve, I said, we're not going to wear you out. And then Safira came up with these three-hour me meetings. And then, <laughs> which, and, and I said, it's only going to last a year. And it did last a year. And so we have something within 12 months. And I, I want to thank Andy and Angela for making sure that we were driven to this, this moment as well. Safira, I have looked through this report. I don't see your name in it. But I, but I'm, I'm humbled by the fact that you didn't put your name in, because you have been a great part of, you know, of the direction that this thing has taken. And so, uh, I thought maybe I had missed it, but I couldn't find your name anywhere. And so that says a lot. That says a lot to me about, uh, you know, your passion for this work as well. So it's not about you. It's about what we're trying to do. So thank you for that. Okay. So I think what we'll we'll do is, unless any member of the council has anything they want to say, we'll. We'll, uh, we'll break here. Again, thank you very much. And uh, the council will just go downstairs and we'll begin to eat. Okay, thank you. Let me show you something. Did you say that's a route going on over there?